A lot of this material and information on random numbers come from some Rajay and Seminole text, The Art of Computer Systems Performance Analysis. I highly recommend this text if you're looking at an applied master's degree in computer science or really any other field for which empiricism is required. That being said, simulation is a useful technique for different areas of scientific inquiry, particularly if the system to be analyzed is not available or is still under construction. Even if the system is available, a simulation can be valuable since we can study the system under a variety of different conditions. Of course, to make a simulation, we need a model. Models exist for many physical and social phenomena. Weather forecasting, for example, hurricane tracking, economic models, etc. Many toys are models. For example, model cars are models of real cars, and dolls are models of real people. Models allow us to tweak parameters in the model and watch the effect where diddling with the real thing is dangerous or impossible, or it may have unpredictable consequences, for example, messing with the weather or the economy. Models capture important properties of their real-world counterparts, but they have some notable differences too. First, they tend to differ in scale from the real thing. Think back to a toy car or truck you had as a child. It probably differs in scale from the real thing. My first bike, pictured here, was a model of a motorcycle, but certainly differed in scale from a real motorcycle. Models also hide details that may be present in the real world version. There certainly wasn't a throttle on this cute little huffy bike. So we may need to develop a model that captures the essence of the real thing while removing incidental details. You may even recall that a Turing machine is a model of a computer, even though it removes a lot of details. And note that I'm not old enough to have had a Turing machine as my first computer. There are a number of common mistakes that can be made in simulations that cause us to get inaccurate results. Let's take a look at some of these common mistakes. In the simulation, level of detail is limited by development time. More detailed simulations require more time to develop. It's not always true that a more detailed model will be a better model. The Turing machine is a fairly simple model of computation, but it lets us see the ultimate limits of computing. Simulation models are generally large computer programs, and unless special precautions are taken, bugs can throw off the results. Even if the simulation has no errors, it can still fail to represent the real system correctly because of incorrect assumptions about the system's behavior. The initial part of the simulation is usually not representative of the system in a steady state. Likewise, not running a simulation for long enough can make the results of the system overly dependent on the initial conditions or early results. This would be akin to stopping votes in the presidential election after the first two states have finished the count. Not all random number generation routines are equal, as we will see later in this module. Likewise, there should be careful selection in the initial seed. If the same seed is chosen every time, as was often the case in early systems, then the results will follow a deterministic trajectory. Now, this may actually be useful if you want to use it to help debug the system. Of course, not all causes of simulation failure can be attributed to the mathematics or the programming of the simulation. Quite a few are actually related to management issues, such as inadequate time estimates for the project, lack of achievable goals, teams lacking the essential skills for the project, for example, not having statistical expertise, no user involvement, or missing documentation. There's quite a bit of terminology related to simulation and modeling, so let's look at that before moving on to types of simulation. The variables whose value define the state of the system are called the state variables. If a simulation is stopped in the middle, it can only be restarted if all of the state variables are known. A change in the system state is called an event. For example, in the CPU scheduling simulation, the arrival of a job would be an event. A model in which the system state is defined at all times is called a continuous time model. If the system state is only defined at particular points in time, then we have a discrete time system. A CPU scheduling model would be a continuous time model. As an example of a discrete time system, consider the voting in an election. This is only going to be defined every two years, although we may be able to make educated guesses as to the political opinion of the country in between elections. A model is either continuous or discrete state, depending on whether the state variables are continuous or discrete. Continuous variables can take uncountably infinite values, for example, the time spent on a task, whereas discrete variables can only take on certain values, for example, the number of students who attend CS408 on a given day. If the output of a model can be predicted with certainty, it is called a deterministic model. On the other hand, a probabilistic model can give different results for different repetitions for the same set of input parameters. A model in which time is not a variable is called static. 
If the system state changes throughout time, then it's called a dynamic model. An example of the static model is the famous E equals MC squared equation, whereas the CPU scheduling system would certainly be a dynamic model. If the output of a model is a linear function of the input parameter, the model is said to be linear, otherwise it is called a nonlinear model. If the input is external to the model, then we say it's an open model. In a closed model, there is no external input. For example, a terrarium would be a closed system, whereas a garden would be an open system. If the dynamic behavior of a model settles down to a steady state, we have a stable model. A model that is continuously changing is called an unstable model. There are a huge variety of simulations out there, but the ones that will be of interest to computer scientists are emulation, Monte Carlo simulation, trace-driven simulation, and discrete event simulation. The simulation that uses hardware or firmware is called emulation. A terminal emulator or a virtual machine is one that simulates one kind of terminal or machine on a different machine. A static simulation or one without a time axis is called a Monte Carlo simulation. These are used to model probabilistic phenomena that do not change characteristics with time. For example, the text uses Monte Carlo simulation to estimate areas and volumes in section 10.2. Trace-driven simulation uses a time-order record of events from real systems. These are quite common in testing out paging algorithms, CPU scheduling, and deadlock prevention algorithms. Trace-driven simulation is good because it is usually viewed as a credible source for fair comparison. It's also pretty easy to validate. On the other hand, they usually require more detailed simulations to get them to work. The simulation using a discrete state model of the system is called a discrete event simulation although it's still possible to have continuous values within the discrete event simulation. All discrete event simulations have a similar structure, so let's take a look at some of the components. The event scheduler keeps track of events waiting to happen. It can schedule events, put events on hold, and even cancel events. We also need to have a simulation clock and time advancement mechanism to work with the scheduler, as well as routines to simulate the events. We also need system state variables and input routines to take in the initial parameters.